Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our Easter Sunday Bible study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the goodness, the sweet victory of your resurrection. We celebrate as a church. We exist as a church. We do what we do as a church because you rose from the dead and, and everything that we are doing is because of that monumental moment. And I just pray for everyone at home who's watching this right now, who maybe has never been to a church or listened to this, a church service, that this moment you would encourage every person that feels uh, distant and lonely and discouraged and that you would use me. Be glorified in this place as I'm for recording this and be glorified in the homes that are listening. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's title, I've decided to call to the sermon, This is Not the End. It's a sentence that I've been wondering why the Lord has been putting on my heart over and over and over again. And I'm sure a lot of you have been telling yourself that this is not the end for the last five weeks. It's not the end. It's going to be fine. We're going to be okay. And, and even for me, as, as I've been uh, pondering church and life as we know it, for these last five weeks, I've been going through it as, as a father, as a husband, as the pastor of this church to remind myself that this can't be the end. And this is, what a crazy moment we're living in. I mean, am I right? But at the same time, what we're facing right now is no different when it comes to moments in life where we have questioned everything. Because there are times in our life where we have questioned everything. There are moments in life when we question how we're going to move forward, how we're going to continue. And I'm sure for every person hearing my voice right now, you can share story after story after story of moments in your life when you wondered, how was I going to be able to move forward? Maybe you experienced a life-threatening illness, and then against all odds, God healed you. Maybe you were on the brink of a failed marriage and what looked like a complete disaster, God restored it. Perhaps you faced economic crisis that made you lose everything, and yet here you are, and God is still providing for you. Maybe there was a time in your life when you questioned whether or not you should live, but then God gave you hope, and he gave you purpose. Maybe you haven't faced that kind of extreme, but maybe uh, you faced extreme doubts in your faith, but God increased your faith through the, through the word of God. So again, can, can you think of moments in your life when you questioned everything, and yet it was in those moments that not only did God prove himself, he healed you, he restored you, he provided for you, he gave you a purpose and a hope, and he increased your faith. And that is why I can say church from home with great confidence, this is not the end. COVID-19 is, is no different. Guys, we're going to move forward. We're going to move forward, not because of any stimulus package or political promise or bank account balance or even because your pastor is telling you. We're going to move forward because Jesus and Jesus alone determines the end. And it's not us and it's certainly not a virus. And the reason Jesus and Jesus alone determines this is because Jesus conquered death. And because Jesus proved once and for all that he is king and he is God. But this is why. Without the resurrection, without the actual rising of the dead of Jesus Christ, everything we're doing would be for nothing. Without the resurrection, this would be the end of all hope and a future but the grave is empty. He's not there. Jesus is not in the grave. 
And that's why when we gather on Easter, usually, traditionally, we celebrate, man. And that's why from your homes, even right now, celebrate with me, won't you? Because the grave is empty. But before Jesus can be raised from the dead, or excuse me, raised from the dead, he first must die for our sins. Listen to this. John chapter 19, verse 17 through 18 tells us, carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called place of the skull. In the Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to a cross. Now Golgotha is one of, I'm emphasizing that word, it's one of the most important locations that shapes Christianity today. The place where Jesus is nailed to a cross. And the image of the cross, it's popular. It's popular all around the world. It's a picture of hope. It's a symbol of hope. It, it symbolizes a future and an excitement that we can have for some. But it also, the very image of itself offends others. And, and, and by the way, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, Paul told us this would happen. I shared this at, at our, on our Good Friday message. We're told in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. You see, crucifixion was not a lovely picture uh, back then, 2,000 years ago, because of what it represented. It was gruesome. It was agonizing. It was embarrassing. It was a cruel way for any criminal to die. In fact, if Jesus was uh, crucified or, excuse me, killed, in today's culture, we probably would read the verse something like, for the message of the electrical chair or the lethal injection is foolishness to those who are perishing. And so instead of wearing a cross, no, you wear an electrical chair and you wear a little syringe around your neck now. It seems absurd. It really does seem absurd. So you can imagine why some 2,000 years ago, the cross, the symbol of it <clears throat> was foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, and that's why with a great excitement, I could say, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's the power of God through the cross. Yeah, a lot of people mock the cross because it's shameful, it's embarrassing, it was a cruel way for a criminal to die, but guys, for us, it's the power of God. We Christians, we know that the symbol of the message is powerful because it was that very thing, the cross, that opened our eyes to sin. And the cross, as heavy as it was, as the weight of sin laid upon the prince of life who hung on it, Jesus will die so that you can live. In fact, we're told in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And, and by the way, Paul is very careful with his words here. He doesn't say Jesus was made to be a sinner. Jesus never became a sinner, but he did allow the weight of our sin to be laid upon himself so that you can live. Another important thing I want to point out is what led Jesus to the cross. We're told in Matthew's gospel that Jesus told his disciples right before he's going to uh, be crucified to go into Jerusalem. He instructed them, hey, by the way, you're going to go into Jerusalem and I, I'm giving you specific instructions and there you're going to find a colt. You're going to find a donkey. And he told them, basically take the donkey. And if anyone asks you why, you tell them the Lord has need of them. And that's exactly what they do. They don't even question it. And we're told this in Matthew 21, 7 through 9. Listen to this. They brought the donkey, the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. That's Jesus. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees, spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When you think of the word Hosanna, what comes to mind? 
Maybe for some of you, you associate it with a declaration of praise, maybe something along the lines of the word hallelujah. But Hosanna actually means it's a plea for salvation. Its Hebrew root word is found in Psalm 118.25. Listen to this. Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. The Hebrew words yasha means deliver and save. The Hebrew word ana means beg and beseech. And if you combine those two words together, it's where we get our English word hosanna. Or it can literally be translated as I beg you to save. Please deliver us. That's why when we sing worship songs, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. So when you go back to the text, as you can imagine, Jesus is riding the colt, the donkey, into the city, and they're singing this to one another. And the crowds were perfectly appropriate when they said, Hosanna, because they were acknowledging that not only was Jesus the Messiah, there, there was a cry for salvation and recognition that it, this one who is riding on the colt, he is the one who's going to be able to save, save us. That's why Easter is not just a once a year message. That's why we can proclaim every Sunday, every single day that he's able to save, that he is able to save. And even from home right now, as you're watching this sermon and you're listening to my voice, you with the same declaration can say, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Another interesting thing about that Matthew 21 text that I just read from is what happens later that day. We're told Jesus is going to visit the temple. After he rides into the city, he goes to the temple, and we're told there were children present, and they were singing something amazing. Listen to this, Matthew 21, verse 15. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, that's referring to Jesus, not only that, but listen to this, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Even the children were moved to, to announce, you are the one who can save. Easter, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, is not just a once a year thing. Easter, the Easter message, is not just an adult thing. Children can understand it. It's a message that even children want to embrace, that even kids can grasp their need for a savior. Another thing I want you guys to note is that the chief priests and the scribes, the text says, saw the wonderful things that he did. Even, even they couldn't deny the work that Jesus was doing was so amazing. It was so wonderful. And yet, the chief priests will convince the same people who shouted, he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. The same people who worship Jesus as the Messiah and, and deliverer on a Sunday will five days later be persuaded by the religious leaders to shout, crucify him, crucify him on a Friday. And they're going to succeed. They're going to nail Jesus to the cross. But even with that murderous plot at hand, this was not the end. This was not the end for Jesus. It was not the end even when Jesus is going to hang on the cross and the weight of sin is going to lay heavy on his shoulders. It still was not the end even when he was going to breathe his last breath and say, it's finished. It is finished. And the Bible will tell us he's going to bow his head and he's going to give up his spirit. It still wasn't the end. And for the disciples who are watching that, as for the disciples who are horrified to see that their, their leader, their savior is going to die and he's now dead. And even for them that watched it, they're probably thinking this is it. This is the end. The Bible says after Jesus' death on the cross that they hid behind closed doors and playing 
They were afraid that was going to happen. What happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. They couldn't help but to wonder if this is the end for Jesus, if this is the end for us. But even for those of you that are watching this right now, I, mean, I want you to think about a time in your life and not to be painful, but I want you to think about a time in your life that was so horrific that you thought, there's no way I can recover from this. There's no going back. There's nothing redeeming about what's going to happen. And perhaps that was the darkest time of your life. For some of you, it, it lasted for days, weeks. For some of you who are watching this right now, it's still lasting even years later. And you're still wondering, how am I going to get through this? And if you are hearing this sermon and you're hearing my voice, I'm here to tell you the promise and the power of Philippians 1, 6, a verse that I share often because I believe in it strongly being confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Guys, Christ wants, wants to begin something in you. And you can be confident that he's not finished until Jesus comes back again. And it was the same for the disciples. Not only was it the same for the disciples, they thought after Jesus' Jesus's death, it was over. They thought it was the end. They thought Jesus is a goner, we're goners too. But the same promise that Jesus gave to us through Philippians, the promise, the power still applied to the disciples. That every disciple who thought Jesus was a goner could be confident in that very thing that he who begun that good work in each of them is still going to complete it because Jesus is going to rise again. Spoiler alert, it's not the end. Yes, Jesus has died, but before he can rise from the dead, he first must be buried. In fact, after Jesus' death, a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, he did something awesome. Uh, we're, we're told in Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 through 60, that he let Jesus borrow something. Listen to this. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from, Ar from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for his body. Pilate issued an order to release it to him, Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. Look, look at this next part, guys. He placed it in his own tomb, which had been uh, carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance. Wait, he, Joseph of Arimathea gave Jesus his own tomb. Why not just give him a new tomb? It's as if he's letting them borrow it. And by the way, we borrow stuff all the time. It's just our culture. It's just, it is what it is. And borrowing implies, I'm going to eventually give this back to you. Like money, whether student loans, home loans, <laughs> evil fun credit cards, those words go hand in hand. People love borrowing money. People love borrowing pens. Why do you think banks have those little straps on them, you know? Because there's this, you know, this problem of people stealing it left and right. Oh, excuse me, I accidentally stole the pen. It's just a pen conspiracy, that's all it is. But people, they really fall into the trap when they buy a truck, including myself. I'm deceived, just like all of you truck owners out there, you're deceived to believe you're gonna be the only one using it. Or your friends, I don't know, I can't think of anyone in particular like Adam Dobbs, our worship leader, will look at your truck and say things like, hey, you have a truck, can I borrow it to move my stuff? Also, can I borrow you uh, with the truck to move my stuff? But there's some things, ladies and gentlemen, we should never let people borrow. There are some things we should just never lend out to people, like a used toothbrush. That's just gross. By the way, if you share a toothbrush, you can't come to the church anymore. Well, I guess no one can come to the church right now, so maybe it's too soon.
but you shouldn't lend out your toothbrush. You certainly shouldn't borrow and lend out a uh, used deodorant. That's like sharing armpit sweat. That's again, it's just gross stuff. Or sharing drinks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how mono spreads in middle schools across the nation. But has anyone ever lent a tomb out? Has anyone ever let someone borrow a tomb? Joseph of Arimathea did. He will give it back, of course. That is Jesus, three days later. Now, I told you Golgotha is one of the most important locations that shapes Christianity, Christianity today. I emphasize it's one of, but in my opinion, it's not the most important. The tomb that Jesus is going to be buried in, in my opinion, is one of the most important things. It shapes, because everyone dies. Everyone dies. But Jesus has proved he has power over death and he can rise from the dead. But when we think of tombs, and I, I told you that it seems like a weird thing that the tomb where Jesus was laid is the most important. But we don't look at tombs like that today. Tombs for us, we visit in, in order to remember the life of a, of a deceased person and painful emotions and waves come when we visit these sites because we're, we're looking at the individual who was once alive but now is dead and we miss them so badly. Tombs are not the most important locations for a lot of people and yet that's why I'm here to tell you with excitement the tomb of Jesus is though because it's empty. Satan did not win. And that's why I love Peter's description when he's talking to the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts. He said this, listen to this, Acts chapter 2, verse 24, when he was referring to Jesus' resurrection. He said, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. Look at this, for death could not keep him in its grips. I just love that. I love that because it's like Peter's talking smack to Satan. It's true. It's as if Peter's saying to the Sanhedrin concerning Satan, hey, remember that one time Satan thought he won? And guess what? It was not the end. Satan, you couldn't keep him down even with your tightest kung fu grip because Jesus rose again. For death, it says back in Acts, could not keep him in its grip. I just love that. So then what did Jesus do after the resurrection? What did this resurrected Savior do? Well, in Acts chapter 1, a book that we're going to go through after we finish the book of Ephesians in our marriage series, we're told in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus, after he had already risen from the dead, he basically spent time with the disciples for over 40 days. I mean, think about that. The disciples witnessed Jesus within a month and a half die, rise from the dead, and then ascend into heaven. Not, yes, it was memorable, but it was a traumatic series of events for the disciples. So what did they do after Jesus ascended and left them? In the same way, what do, what do we do? What do we do after an Easter message? What do we do after this thing we called Easter? Because a lot of you can't gather at homes in large groups anymore, and you can't... Uh, have normal after church lunch with large gatherings. So what, what, do we, what do we do? What do we do after an Easter message? Well, as frustrating as this may sound, I think the disciples paint a perfect model for us as a church on what to do. Why is it frustrating, John? Listen to this. In Acts 1.14, we're told this. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his disciples. The text says they continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. That word, or the phrase I should say, one accord, is found six times in, in the book of Acts. Six times. Easter is once a year, but fellowshipping and prayer take place all year. That's why it's frustrating, because we're in a time where COVID-19, this thing called the coronavirus, is steering the ship of our community. We can't meet right now. 
We can't, not only can we not meet right now, you can't meet with anyone 10 or under in your household. So John, you're saying after an Easter message, we should have uh, basically fellowship with one another. Yes. Are you telling us to break the law? I am not saying that. Because they gather together in one accord in fellowship, but also in prayer. We do have prayer again until we can meet again. And that's the beauty of the church, Christ's bride, is that he did. Guys, God hardwired us to have fellowship. We need fellowship, even after the resurrection. Easter and Christmas don't have to be a once a year practice, that Jesus actually wants us to pray together, to fellowship together all year round. But <laughs> that's why this is frustrating. We can't even do that right now. But if COVID-19 has taught us anything, especially for me, if COVID-19 has proven anything, it's this. We're going to be stronger after this is done. How do you know that for sure, John? Because I think more than ever from home, you are valuing community more than you ever did. You're realizing how much you need fellowship. I'm wondering how many of those who are hearing my voice and you proclaim yourself as a, as a sustaining introvert. You work best as an introvert. You like being by yourself. And when the shelter in place announcement came, you probably thought, you know what? I'm an introvert. I like being alone. I've got my books. I've got my thoughts to myself. But now, five weeks later, you're going crazy and you feel like you're going to end up on the news for bad reasons if you don't spend time with someone here soon. Uh, I need to be around church family. I need to be around people. I actually don't blame you. You can imagine if it's getting bad for the, intro or for the introverts, how we extroverts are doing and how we're sustaining Barely is the answer to that question. A lot of you are feeling a deficiency in fellowship right now. You are realizing more than ever, you need to interact and have community back in your life. That's because God hardwired you that way. And even though you have these little spurts here and there before the COVID-19 thing happened, and that was sufficient for you, you, you're going on week five that we're not gathering together. And you're feeling it. You're beginning to feel it. And I'm the first to say, guys, I'm feeling it. I cannot wait till we can open the church doors and be able to minister to one another again. But you know what's even more exciting to me than that? I'm looking forward and I'm more excited when we can open up our homes, break bread and fellowship with one another again. Because the church can't just be gatherings on a Sunday. It's got to be meeting outside of this facility on Sundays. But we can't even do that right now. So yet again, I ask the question, what do we do after an Easter message like this? We may not have one another physically to interact with, but we have something else. Most of you from home right now are saying, we have Zoom conference calls. That's not what I'm talking about either. I'm not talking about that. We have the Holy Spirit. Guys, after Jesus ascends into heaven, gets the disciples excited because he, Jesus died. Then he rises again. And then he spends time with them for 40 days. And then Jesus is like, okay, I'm leaving now. And the disciples are like, are you kidding me? But Jesus didn't just leave them high and dry. He left them the Holy Spirit. And now not only do they have the power of the Holy Spirit inside them, the same Holy Spirit that raises Jesus from the dead is now available to them. They now can identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus because of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Romans chapter 6, verse 7 through 11, we're told, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all but the life that he lives he lives to god likewise you also reckon yourself to be dead to indeed to sin i love that wording listen to the last last part 
but you are alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The disciples then, even for us today, we're the bride of Christ. We now identify and have this commonality as the bride. And if Christ was raised from the dead, we are going to be raised from the dead also. Still hard though, as we're separated. And I've concluded when we're confused or uncertain of what Jesus is trying to do in our life, that prayer and fellowship become the very thing that keeps us sane and stable. In fact, I would dare say isolating ourselves only makes things worse. And I think that's why for a lot of you who are watching this from home, like me, you're going crazy because you're unable to have community and people to fellowship with in the church, outside of the church in your homes. And it's hard. And I, yes, it's easy to worry and freak out, but trust me when I say it, it's sometimes harder to just wait on the Lord. And this is a time we're all waiting. We're all waiting for the social distancing to be lifted. We're all waiting to have a safe place to gather again. But instead of freaking out and instead of watching the news and waiting for your phone to beep and bing when you get a Fox News report or whatever news report, and you're like, hopefully there's new information that's going to make me feel happy again. Perhaps in your time of waiting, as the Lord is making us all wait, the Lord is asking you to seek him and to wait on him to utilize the Holy Spirit. Because here's the thing, we're limited on what we can do right now. But we're not limited in prayer. We're not limited in, in, in truly seeking him. And that's why even for me, as I was prepping this message and as, I, as I've been thinking these last five weeks, this isn't the end. So if it isn't the end, what should I do until we can gather again? And the Lord's been like, seek me, man. Fall more in love with me. And some of us are asking the question, well, how long though? But how long though? How long do we wait? Sometimes we have to wait all day. Listen to this. Psalm 25, 5 says, For you are the God of my salvation. On you, I wait all day. But no one likes to wait. Especially now. No one likes to wait. We want quick answers, or excuse me, we want answers that bring quick results. It is hard to wait all day, much less wait months especially for shelter in place to be lifted. We're waiting uh, for this flattening of the curve to take place so that we can gather safely, might I add, so that we can gather safely again with one another. I mean, if you were to tell me <laughs> that my first year as the pastor of this church, my first Easter message as the pastor of this church, I'd be speaking to an empty room due to COVID-19, I would have laughed. I probably would have pushed you. Not hard, but a playful push. It's not going to happen. And here we are. Or at least here James and I are. We're the only ones in the room right now. Even James in the back is wearing a suit. Not really. But even as you're watching this from home, Guys, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I know you're, you're eager to get back, and I know you can't wait till we can be together, and I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that bandwagon. But even as you're watching from home, I'm here to tell you that Jesus is worth it. He's worth waiting on. He's worth seeking. And I think the psalmist was right when he said, for you are the God of my salvation. Hosanna, right? And on you I will wait all day. We may not be able to meet now, but we can wait on the Lord. We can seek him in the word. We can even worship in the midst of uncertainty. I think that's why worship music has become very powerful. Times to really express our adoration to the Lord, to express our brokenness to God. We can do all of these things until we can meet again. And that is why I could say, even with great confidence, this is not the end. This is not the end. COVID-19 is not the end of everything. 
We're going to move forward, not because of any stimulus package or political promise or bank account balance, or even because I, the pastor, am telling you this. We're going to move forward because Jesus is the one who determines the end. Jesus is the one who holds time in his hands. And it's this reason that Jesus and Jesus alone can be the only one to determine it because he is the only one that has conquered death. And if he can conquer death, then that tells me not only does he know the outcome of the future, it tells me we can serve and worship and seek not only that, but give our life to devote, to, to be devoted to serve him all the days of our life. Even right now, Jesus is worth it. And I know it because he, he died for my sins, guys, but he also rose from the, the, the grave. That is why without the resurrection, everything we're doing right now would be for nothing. Without the resurrection, this would be the end. This would be the end without the resurrection of, of any hope or a future. But that's why the grave is empty. Jesus isn't there anymore. The Easter message is important because his death becomes the payment and proof that our sin was bought, purchased, and paid for. And his resurrection validates the payment of the death of him on the cross. You know, the morning, the Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the grave. Women came to his tomb. And they came to bring spices and they probably came like all of you when you go visit, when you visited to him, you, you go to, to commemorate and, and honor the person. They certainly were bringing spices because back then that, that was a form and a way to help with decomposition, with the smell. But when they came to the tomb, the stone that was in front of it is rolled away and Jesus isn't there. So they come to a tomb where there's no Jesus, but there's two men, two angelic beings. And they announce something to the women. Matthew 24, verses 5 through 7. Then, as they were afraid, that's the women, they bowed their faces to the earth they said to them, and now this is the angels, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. Here's the best part. And the third day will rise again. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He rose again. He conquered death so that we too, listening to my voice right now, can say death can't hold its grip on me because there is victory in the cross. There is even greater victory in the resurrection. And now the power of death is no longer on me. Oh, death, where is your sting? This is not the end. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we can celebrate even from our homes that this is not the end, that we're going to gather again. But we know that this is a time you want us as we are waiting and waiting. Lord, your word says to be still and know that you're God. You tell us to make our requests to, known to you. And that's what right now we want to do. We want to be utilized in the time that we're separated to not only seek you, but Lord, to give us a deeper appreciation for the power of the resurrection in our lives, that we're too raised to life, that anyone basically who dies and believes in you will live. And if you're watching this sermon right now, if you're listening to this later down the road, and man, the Lord has been trying to get a hold of your life, and you know you need to give your life to him. You've never gone to a church or maybe you've gone every once in a while to church and you certainly wouldn't go to an Easter message, but here you are, you're watching this sermon. You're listening to my voice and I'm here to tell you, I believe the Lord is wanting you to give your life to him. 
that this isn't a coincidence and this wasn't random, that you're listening for a reason. And maybe that's because this is the day that you can announce that I gave my life to the Lord hearing a sermon online during COVID-19 in 2020. And I'm so thankful because if it had not been for this time where we're separated, but you're watching me and you're hearing my voice, you probably never would have done what you're about to do. And that is give your life to Jesus. He loves you. He died for you. And he died for you so you can live. And he proved once and for all that he is God because he rose from the dead. And if that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus, repeat after me. Jesus, I believe you are God. And I believe you did die on the cross for me. And I want to give you my life. I want to serve you with my life. I belong to you now, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross and rising from the dead. And thank you that you loved me enough to let me give my life to you. You're worth it, Jesus. And I thank you. And it's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.